Thank you for joining us here today. It's a privilege to be joined by this distinguished panel of leaders to discuss some of the most important topics of our time. And we're grateful that the technology has enabled us to come together globally and virtually and assembles a diverse group from all over the world. It's quite remarkable. My name is Alan Fleischman. I'm the founder, chairman, and CEO of Laurel Strategies, a global CEO advisory firm that works on strategy, messaging, and positioning with some of the most formidable leaders from around the world. And today, I'll be moderating a conversation among a group who are each formidable in their own right about what it's like to lead in this age of uncertainty and disruption. The past 15 months have certainly tested leaders in the public sector, private sector, and civil society. They've had to contend with unexpected shocks of, global, of a global pandemic, um, other issues that quickly upended daily life while also shining a spotlight on longstanding societal challenges that no longer can be unaddressed. In the search for solutions become abundantly clear that the private sector has a central role to play in the, in the, way, in the path that we need to forge going forward. Our panelists today are visionaries in their own respective fields, and they're here to discuss some ways in which they and the companies they lead, the firms that they lead, continue to address such disparities and disruptions. Uh, I want to start with Ibukun Awosia Isika, chairman of the First Bank of Nigeria, the first woman to hold that position, and is the founder and chief executive officer of the Chair Center Group. Uh, Ibukun, better? Yeah, Ibukun Ibukun. is passionate about social issues and chairs a number of corporate and non for profit boards advocating for women and inspiring future entrepreneurs. Uh, we've got Chris Gobalakrishnan, Krishnan is the chairman of Oxylor Ventures, a seed fund, and one of the founders, co founders of Infosys, the global IT consulting firm. Chris is widely recognized as a global leader and technology, a thought leader, and as a philanthropist himself. Alan Patrickoff is a founder and managing director of Greycroft, Greycroft, a venture capital firm. And for 40 years, he's been the innovator in venture capital and private equity, and he's been instrumental in growing the venture capital field. Alan has helped build and foster growth among numerous global companies. And Michael Schwo, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Schwo, a leading real estate owner, investor, developer, operator of unique and innovative luxury and landmark properties across the United States. Michael draw, draws from his experience, a very diverse one in real estate, from brokerage to marketing to sales and to development, to guide his firm in creating and reimagining one-of-a-kind properties at some of the most iconic and important sought-after locations in the world. Thank you all for joining me today. This is going to be fun. I thought I'd start off with a question that I'd like to direct to each one of you. The, you know, the conditions created by the pandemic these past 15, 16 months have tested the leadership of executives from all sectors and all regions. It's the one thing that unites all of us, whether you're in any parts of the world. What are some of the skills and facilities that have needed, that you needed to call upon as a leader during this time? And which ones did you need to develop? I'd love to uh, have you jump in and we can kind of go around here a little bit. Chris, do you want to start? Thank you, uh, Alan. Um, and uh, thank you uh, for having me in this, uh, I think, very important uh, topic. Uh, the pandemic has, as you rightly said, tested all of us and tested leadership. And I look at uh, three aspects of leadership uh, that the pandemic has tested us. The first is the aspect of uh, uh, the use of science and technology, the use, the, the, um, the, the role played by trust, the role played by um, facts. Uh, because first and foremost, <clears throat> we, need to, we need to save lives using science and technology and we need to uh, we need to make sure that uh, you know every citizen is vaccinated uh, as and when the vaccines are available as and when their turn comes and this requires leadership that can inspire trust this requires leadership that uses facts uh, transparency uh, to make sure that the vaccine is available for everyone 
second uh, aspect that has been tested is um, the aspect of uh, uh, you know use of um, capital investments our networks um, the ability to collaborate um, across uh, industry academia government because uh, you know for example uh, in india ventilators were not being manufactured uh, before the pandemic so we had to quickly uh, bring all these uh, stakeholders together and 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 create a capacity to manufacture ventilators and india now exports ventilators so this has to be uh, a a a very important role leadership will play similarly you know uh, investing together in uh, creating a vaccine uh, investing together to make sure that the supply chains are there investing together to make sure that enough capacity uh, is there across the world to vaccinate uh every uh, again uh, person in the world uh, it has to be equitable it has to be uh, you know accessible to every citizen in the world so that's the second aspect of the leadership the third aspect of the leadership is about uh, philanthropy corporate social responsibility uh, and and making sure that again coming back to the pandemic uh, making sure that again every citizen has access to vaccine for example you know there are places in the world where uh, vaccine is not being manufactured there are places where vaccine is not affordable and we know that uh, none of us are safe until all of us are safe so how do you ensure that as leaders we make sure that uh, you know equitable distribution of vaccine happens you know if in one country we start vaccinate people uh, let's say uh, above the age of 12 and in the other, in another part of the world people with comorbidities are not being vaccinated then you know it is not an equitable distribution of vaccine so yeah. how do we ensure that uh, this happens so these are the three aspects of leadership i think that are very important during the pandemic that's very helpful um ibukun i'm sorry okay uh, same same question okay first for uh, uh, completeness my role at the bank uh, ended at the end of april the rest of my life continues as you stated it just to make sure that we have the information correct and in terms of um leadership and its ability to respond in the um uh, in the midst of the what the world has been in the last uh one year the well more than a year now we're almost at 18 months of all of this what is key is um ability to look at the scenario um from a 360 degree view looking at it holistically and being able through leadership to guide the right kind of decisions and actions that will enhance our ability to protect every citizen within our country and those who come in and out of our, our country in many ways in our case there were real issues to deal with in terms of um providing for the people especially when you're talking in terms of uh, the uh, economic challenges across different social class and its impact and the um resultant social issues that came out of that within uh, the process of also trying to take our leadership our leadership decisions that were necessary in order to protect everyone uh from uh, the covid scenario but still realizing that whilst one decision seems right for the situation that decision also has unintended consequences that are a result of existing problems that were not dealt with in advance so the ability of leadership to respond to the situation in order to deal with the immediate but also to take the learnings for planning for future situations of facts that are uh, one would have to consider in the midst of that and one one major thing is it's not about us it's not about individuals it's about all of us is how we take actions and decisions that protect the interest of all of us so that we can all be safe uh, together and that sometimes requires that we come out of our golden gates you know into the town square and be part of making the right decisions that protects everyone thank you that's great thank you michael 
Sorry, let me unmute myself. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, and, and following the two distinguished speakers, uh, um, which I think gave a very good kind of overview of the, at, you know, at, at, at a global level and, the, and the, the kind of the corporate responsibility of making sure that, that we get the entire world uh, um, back on track. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to, uh, you know, take it a, a little bit, kind of go to a different, to a different aspect of, of leadership is really uh, um, as, and if you look at some of the people here, as, as, as CEO of companies, what we need to do, um, um, you know, in our, in our own backyard, in our own house, um, and what we had to do over the last year and a half, really to, to keep our organizations going, right, to keep our people going, um, to make sure that, that, that they get out of their pajamas and actually do work. Right? And, and, and not get depressed, which, which, you know, these are, these, some of these things are, are, seem like they might be mutually exclusive, right? So a year and a half back, Alan, you recall, we were talking actually publicly also on a different panel, and there was tremendous amount of fear in the world, right? I mean, I think that if we remember today, we're all sitting here and, and we're in New York, people don't wear masks anymore, but a year and a half, um, people thought the world's coming to an end. I mean, I don't want to sound over dramatic, but we all recall... March, April, and now we were together on a panel, and I said, I have no clue what's going to happen. I just know that if you read the Bible, you know, God said, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to wipe out the world yet, as I did. So, you know, that was really, to me, the only thing that we, we, we knew as certain. And from there, that was the starting point. And, you know, through, through the past year and a half, I guess what I found, which, which was a, a challenge, but really that had a good result at the end is how do you keep your, your teams together? How do you keep your employees together, your partners together when you can't really come into face-to-face -face contact? I'm a strong believer that face-to-face -face contact is extremely important. Um, and how do you keep everybody kind of together in corporate culture over Zoom? I think that, that the, the answer is it's impossible. We all did our best. We all know that we did our best, but it's impossible. And and I don't want to. We will we will speak later about this, I'm sure. But there's been a lot of talk in the market about people not coming back to work and people working from home and all these different structures. And I, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the real estate side of things, but the reality is that none of that is really sustainable. And we've seen that through the leadership over the last year and a half. As I said, we we used to have weekly zooms with the entire company, just so. And I had I, I encourage people to just tell us what they were doing different through the pandemic, what they found time to do when, for things that they never had time, really trying to, to, to humanize a little bit the situation where everybody was sitting at home uh, uh, locked up. We can't, we can't forget, and again, of course, the, the health issue is at a global, from a global perspective is the most important thing, but we also can't forget the personal items here. Obviously, those, those that, that, that there's a lot of, you know, mental stress that people went through over the last year and a half. And I think we're going through, we're seeing now as the world evolves and as we're coming out of it, um, I think that that there's, there's been a lot of positive uh, uh, changes that, that we are going to see kind of in, in the near future. That's right. That's great. How about you, Alan? Well, I, I hate to be redundant uh, to Michael. Michael just said that uh, what, uh, what I had plan to say, and I will still say it in perhaps a different way, I think one of the biggest technological changes in the thing is that everybody's learned to accommodate not being in the same office. I mean, that is a profound, profound change in the how we conducted our business life and our personal life and our social life. Everything has changed, and we have had no choice but to adapt, adapt to that. Uh, and uh, I think that though some did, some did it successfully, some did it unsuccessfully or not able to uh, accomplish the integration. I mean, keeping staffs together involved not just having a Zoom call once a week, but thinking about how to keep them uh, involved on a personal basis. I know from the standpoint of Great Crop, we did, these are not technology, we would have social events, we had cultural events, we had uh, uh, game nights, we had, uh, we did everything, things that we never had done, ever had done as a firm when we would meet together because we kind of took it for granted. But there was an enormous effort to 
keep the group together and that uh, whatever technologies were available besides Zoom were used. Uh, audio played a very important part, I would have to say. Uh, so I, I wanted to bring that. I think that, and I don't know, I don't think we're going to go back, but I absolutely share Michael's feelings. That cannot last as a permanent way of operating. Uh, it is, uh, we, we, we're we're uh, normal, uh, we're beasts who like to be together. And whether it's, I mean, I, I all of us have probably gone to dinner parties the last week and you can't for you that exists when people get together, uh, it just changes their whole life's uh, life. The second thing, I want to say that I, uh, while I'm credit for Greycroft, I started a new firm right at the start of the pandemic. It started last February, which was a company called Primetime Partners, which was a venture firm focused on just anything, product services, uh, experiences for the age, what I call the ageless generation, which probably fits some some of the other panelists and maybe some of the people on the in the audience. But uh, there is the fastest growing part of society, except perhaps for India or for some parts of Africa, but certainly in Europe, China, Japan, the United States, definitely fastest growing part of the population is the elderly, the the ageless. The, let's say oh, you can pick it over fifty, over fifty five, over sixty, uh, and those people are going to have more money, last, live longer. And as a result, they need all kinds of new services and uh, technologies. And, one of, and I'll, I'll, I'll just close with this. Uh, the pandemic has been a great, great boom to making these people, many of whom will age at home, isolated. This has given them an impetus. They had no choice but to figure out how to be connected, even though they may be isolated. And so the the uh, introduction of technology to the uh, ageless <coughs> group, we know the millennials, they, they, they're they totally integrated, but it's the over 60s who never went through that, the baby boomers who uh, have had no choice and they have uh, accelerated by years their familiarity and comfort with working on available technologies, whether it's simple as a mobile phone or a conference call or a, or, or a Zoom call, uh, they've had no choice and to use remote services, delivery services, all of these things that they avoided before because they did things in, con in person, now they're having to do. So the, the pandemic has been a boon to those people. You know, it certainly when we're coming out of this, the one thing that will be different, I think, is that we we acknowledge that science matters, that science wins, because we couldn't be having these conversations about getting back after 16 months or 15 months if it hadn't been for the vaccine and for science. Technology matters, as you're pointing out, obviously. Uh, I'd be curious also, you know, for the older generations or for the ageless, um, are there certain technologies in particular that you think will be transformational coming forward? Well, I think, uh, yeah. uh, well, uh, 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 Chris has his hand up. Let him, yeah. let him yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, Alan, uh, technology and science matter, provided we do the right things. We use it properly. That's very, very important. As uh, Alan Patrikov said, um, you know, um, you know, there is uh, uh, there is now awareness that, uh, you know, health is very important. How we age is very important. Aging, uh, health, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I say that uh, we need to uh, live healthy and uh, age gracefully. I think it's very, very important. And the second aspect of uh, technology is, um, you know, digitization has increased, right? All of us have to um, use digital te technologies more. But here again, uh, usability becomes very important. Is the technology uh, usable by all people, you know, um, uh, you know, is it usable by older people? Is it usable by let's say for example in india we have 300 million people who are not literate we have uh, multiple languages so is the technology available in the vernacular or local languages all of these things matter and these are choices that uh, leaders must make to ensure that uh, you know they create a fair society i think so technology helps but use of technology 
and how you put that technology to use is extremely important. So, uh, Alan, I, I think I just want to add one thing. You know, uh, um, Alan was saying, uh, um, you know, a key word that is really, I think, the what what the pandemic did to us, and and obviously, you know, in in, in his business, but it really. Uh, COVID was an accelerator for the world at every single level. Um, Alan is talking about how it accelerated the use of technology in the elderly. Um, we know that it accelerated, you know, um, businesses, w w which, which really, I think that we all know that, that businesses at, at, every, at every category, if you came into the, um, to the pandemic um, strong financially with a good business foundation, um, most like you, 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 not only you came out of it, you came out of it stronger. If you came in weak, um, there's a high likelihood you went out of business. But we're seeing that everything from, from you know, the vaccination, right? Countries that, that, that were not well prepared uh, um, and, not, and not well capitalized, uh, um, as opposed to countries that were well prepared. I mean, you look at Israel as an example, a country that, that made miracles as the number one in, in, in vaccinating uh, uh, people. Uh, but, you know, Alan is right, and particularly on the technology side, we've seen an acceleration of technology and use of technology. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to stay there forever, but I do think that, that and I agree with, with what Alan is saying, I think at, at the elderly um, that had no, or older people had no choice but to adapt to technology, and without COVID, it would have probably never happened, right? Because they'd get older, they, they wouldn't find the use of technology, and today, um, you're seeing you're seeing that that technology has opened a lot more communication channels that I don't think we'd never have. So, you know, from everything, every you know, as a religious person that I am, you always believe that when something bad happens, there's actually a good outcome. And I think that we all know that there are some fantastic outcomes out of this COVID. Unfortunately, there's a lot of other sad things that happen on the way. But we'll step back five years from now, ten years from now, and and I think that we will see. That that there are some some changes in the world that happen that are that are definitely positive, and and people either capitalize on them not just financially but but just socially and and, and you know and um, and well, connecting people. Yeah, one thing we're going to see. Sure. Is, sure. Is, I was going to say something. Talking, okay. going to no, I was just going to say that you know one other thing to consider is apart from uh, the ageless group being. Uh, the technology's usage being enhanced, businesses' adoption, the adoption of, of technology by businesses at every level also increased dramatically. And the realization that if you're not able to use um, different technology to enhance the ability of your business to deliver services, it also helped a lot of businesses to be leaner because then you could take out all the fat within the period of all of the trials of COVID and you realize that you didn't need as much fat as you had uh, around in terms of uh, manpower, teams, and all of that. And I think a lot of businesses benefited from being able to do some of the things they always thought, well, we could do it, but we can't, and all of that. It sort of forced the decisions in many ways as uh, businesses were able to clean up. So I think, yeah, I mean, it was a challenging period, but a lot of value that's come out of it. And it also brought communities together in, in multiple ways because people had to learn to work together for everybody to survive within the period. So yes, it did have its many values. So those, who had, those who had access advanced, broadband, certainly technology is helping us get there now. That's advancing quickly too. As, as Michael pointed out, those who didn't get access obviously had more had more struggles um but you know the, the next phase will be those who have technology and how do we create that access but i'm curious curious michael i know from you before the pandemic you were already using technology and finding ways to curate different ways in which people can work and live within their office lives uh you know in, in a way that was actually not so dissimilar to the way they aspired to live in their community and home lives that must have advanced now i imagine in the way you're dealing with it. It's, it's, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's, in, it's interesting because, you know, part of what we have, we've done and we're doing um, is the exact opposite of what people did at COVID, right? So our part of the, the big driving force behind Chevelle is that we really bring the, the residential and the hospitality experience into the office space, right? So 
if it's the, the, the luxury resorts or if it's a luxury hotel experience, uh, we bring that into kind of super unique, uh, um, super unique real estate. We recently bought the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco, which is getting a major overhaul. Um, and, and in essence, you're going to walk into the lobby of that building. It will feel like you walked into a Four Seasons hotel. But what we've seen in the pandemic is the exact opposite, right? People took their work experience and brought that to the home. And I think that, as, as I said, it really doesn't work. And I think that, that what the, the difference between bringing the home experience to work, which is really just giving you, um, doesn't mean that you're sleeping in the office, right? But it does mean that you actually pay attention to how people work, to what's important, um, giving people space, giving people air, giving people, you know, the luxuries that they would have or, or, or the experience that they would have from a service uh, uh, perspective at their home, having that at the office as well, um, once you do it the other way around, you don't have the work home separation, which is probably the biggest problem that people had working from home, right? You you don't have that moment where, again, hard for me to say that because I always work, even when I'm sleeping, I work. But 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 for a lot of your employees, they go home, they go to meet friend, they go you know on a social on a social endeavor if it's dinner, if it's to a bar, if they go out, whatever they do. Um, and then they go home, right? And there is that that kind of shift between working and playing or working and living. And now when you're working from home, there is no shift. You wake up and most people remember that that work in smaller spaces and live in smaller spaces. We we all know that people have been sitting on their bed and working from their bed and sleeping from their bed and eating on their bed. And, and it, it becomes one big salad and it takes a tremendous amount of toll. So I think that I'm very happy that, you know, People are coming back to the office. You know, when 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 I'm asked the question, you know, is is are people going to work from home? Is is going to be a change? Normally, I just answer the answer is no. I don't need to expand on it. The answer is no. The whole idea that working from home and everybody's going to work from home in their pajamas is not going to sustain. It's not going to happen. Um, I've said this numerous times, Alan. I've been saying that for the past year and a half. And again, I'm not. You know, I ain't that smart. But I go back to the Bible, chapter two, it says, the Lord said, it's not good for man to be by himself. We as human beings are not meant to be alone. We can be together, right? If you look at the minute that the city's open, the first thing that everybody does, you see the streets full of people. You see people get together. There is a natural instinct of, for us to be together. Together is not what we're doing now. It's nice to see everybody's faces. But, you know, ha- being fully concentrated, being fully immersed in a conversation with somebody, you can only do in person. I don't care how good the technology is. You can't take that out of the system. So, yes, technology helps and technology solves a lot of issues. But I think we all agree and every CEO or every executive on this on, that's sitting in the listening to us would agree that when you have a first meeting with somebody, right, if you have that meeting over Zoom, you will most likely not remember that person. And if you do, it's another picture. Now it's a different, Alan and I maybe know each other, we've seen each other in person so we can have a Zoom because we've had, we've shared a meal together. But it's very difficult to have that same feeling and that same experience sure. and that same relationship with somebody that you've never met in person because it's another photo on Zoom, it's another photo that when you shut down your computer, you go to the next Zoom and the next Zoom. So I, I just want to remind everybody not not to think that that, you know, technology will not take over our lives because we are human beings at the end of the day. And and nobody here is a kid. I'm probably the youngest one on the group, or maybe Alan is. Um, and I can tell you that that I am not this Alan. Yeah. <laughs> I can't I can't I can't wait. You know, I can't wait to get to get uh, 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 to be in person. And obviously now in New York, we we are gathering together. We are having dinners with people and and. You know, you learn to appreciate. I remember the first time I went out for dinner after COVID. It's like, wow, I went to dinner. But I went to that same restaurant 50 times already, and I never appreciated it. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you appreciate things sure. that, 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 that you never did. So I think a lot of good come out of it. The only thing that's important is that we don't forget. Right? No, I was just going to say that we just can't, we can't forget because if we forget, we're not going to appreciate but, but you know that we do, right? Because if you look at September 11, and I hate to take this to another – so we lived in New York in September 11. I rem- you know, I, I'll never remember that. That was a horrific moment here. But people, I'm not saying they forgot, 
But a lot of big changes that happened socially then went flew out the window. So, you know, I think this this is going to be a, this is a much deeper. The pandemic is a much deeper uh, uh, um, kind of crack and a deeper event in, in, in society. And I hope that we forget that we don't forget and we continue to appreciate kind of the things that we have every day that we take for granted. Maybe that's right. I mean, and the one thing we could decide or we can make sure we don't forget is that technology can be our friend. It's not an either or. We're going to need the interaction, the interpersonal, the connectivity. I think we all agree on that. But we also have the ability with technology to, to create a more equitable world, too. Because the one thing that happened in a lot of organizations is you, you gave access to people who normally would never have been in that meeting or never been in that conversation because they could, because everybody was in an equal platform, equal an equal basis. And that, that I hope we don't lose, too, because it allows for greater conversation. So there'll be some hybrid meeting. We'll meet in person, but we might connect other people by by Zoom at that meeting. How we figure that out so it's actually, um, you know, healthy and normal and and, and, and natural. Uh, we'll have to figure out. But I think the idea that we've created longer and larger conversations with people is so important. I am curious, Alan. We're all interested in living forever, so you do have us a little. Bit. The fact that you're figuring out and you're identifying technologies for the ageless. Uh, is important. I don't. It's not longevity investments, right? It's more about quality. Oh, yes, yes. The, 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 there's a great interest at the moment in in the whole subject of longevity. How do I live longer? There is an enormous focus right now. Of it, it ties into also to preventive medicine. How do I make sure I don't get diabetes, or if I have the possibility, if there are the signposts, if there are biomarkers that suggest I could, how do I do something? early on to prevent it. The same with Alzheimer's, the same with potentially cancer, all everything that can be prevented. And there are many uh, groups and technologies developing right now to monitor people early on to see that that doesn't happen. I want to bring up another uh, point that is uh, uh, we shouldn't lose sight of. Everyone on this call, there are now, I see 40, uh, uh, but not just the panelists, uh, are going to be a caregiver in their life. We don't stop to think of it, but there in the United States, you know, we consider at the moment there are 50 million caregivers who are not getting paid. Their sons, daughters, uh, daughter-in-laws, cousins, uncles, and at some point, and I've found this out in the last year of the 14 investments we've made so far, I would say 13 of them started by someone who had someone in their family have some, someone close to them have some problem. So uh, the whole issue of the need for caregiving and uh, from amateurs like all of us and that training of those people and the connection of those people with services and the monitoring of people who are the people who are getting to the stage where they need to be watched are all new kinds of I'll use technologies with quotes that they're not you know they're not breakthrough like a new microprocessor or a, or a, a, a chip uh, but they are they are nevertheless uh, technical needs of how to deal with this enormous uh, pressure that's going to have everyone who's going to be a caregiver probably is working how do they balance their time what how are businesses going to accommodate that time uh, pr uh, President Biden has in his program, $400 million, $400 billion, I guess, for, forgive me, it's a B, not an M anymore, uh, of dealing with this whole idea of child caregiving and, and elderly caregiving and, and the burdens it's putting on society and how to deal with those and coming up with new ideas uh, for servicing that. that. That's a big, big opportunity and demand. Which actually will speak to the idea that we're going to need technology to allow people to have flexibility when they need to take care of family members and be at home too, which is going to be a little bit against the other part of the conversation, but because uh, you need to be in person when you're doing that as well, often uh, as well. Well, that depends on if you want to do it yourself or if what I think Alan is talking about is the business model that that represents in itself. Because when you, you're talking in terms of um, maybe like on our side of the world, creating jobs and opportunities for people, that might be a whole new industry where you make the necessary investment supported by whatever technology is available and all of that. And you create a whole new uh, level of people who are economically engaged in that sector to support uh, that need that exists. 
Well, I don't, I don't want, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm saying, yes, there is, that is a whole profession. But what I'm saying is the amateurs like us who aren't, that's not our profession, have to, uh, there have to be techniques for us to be able to provide that function and work at the same time and carry on our families. And we're going to need technologies. I mean, a perfect example is remote sensing, which is now being introduced into senior living facilities and into people just in their homes to, you know, prevent things and to know, uh, to do sensing of what their sleep habits are, what their walls, uh, uh, and, and what's monitoring their, their, their vital signs so that you can, get ahead of the problem. So there's there's a lot of things that are being done because we're going to have to make better use of all of the rest of us who are not in the profession. But the profession... Is that going to create, Chris, a, a need to be more in the urban environment rather than in the rural environment in countries around the world? Are we going to need to go and be nearer to our cities where there's medical care, where there's going to be... Or is it going to allow for technology and telemedicine to actually spread it out further outside the service? Uh, clearly, uh, technology is uh, a big part of the solution. Uh, we need to make sure that. Uh, but the, the 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 mental shift that we need to make is, um, you know, healthcare to date was about curative part of the healthcare. You know, when we get sick, we go to a doctor. When we get sick, we go to a hospital or a clinic. But uh, healthcare shift should shift to preventive. That means we actually, when we are healthy, start monitoring. We start talking to our healthcare professionals and try and make sure that we are in the green zone. That means, as Alan uh, rightly said, how can we, if there are risks associated with our lifestyle, if there are risks associated with our uh, DNA, you know, the genetic sequence that we have uh, to lifestyle diseases and things like that, it's important that we need to look at uh, uh, how do we live, how do we eat, how do we exercise, what is our mental health and things like that, and technology can help. Uh, we can also leverage technology for telemedicine and things like that. It means, you know, uh, our uh, vital statistics are monitored uh, by machine. It will uh, it will give us early indication. It will give, us, give the, um, the doctor early indication of how we are faring. And if we are not uh, doing the right things, even our insurance costs will go up. So that is a disincentive or an incentive for us to stay healthy. So all of these things are now being packaged to actually shift the focus from curative part of healthcare to the preventive part of the healthcare. And, and this is the transition that is happening uh, in the industry. This is also the transition that is happening as individuals because the individuals will also have to transition and they have to be incentivized to transition and the technology has to be made available for them to transition. Michael, I mean, do you see that? I mean, I, you, obviously, you're in several cities uh, in this in the United States. No, I'm thinking about you know, what Chris is saying, and and and, and, and you know, and uh, um, and what Alan is saying, and it, it, it's kind of interesting, right? It's always, of course, it makes sense that you want to deal with preventive uh, uh, um, healthcare as opposed to reactive healthcare. But you know, it's, 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 it reminds me a little bit of the same thing when you go through airports and they still make you take your shoes off, right? Because 10 years ago, somebody tried to bomb a plane with a, with a shoe, right? We're always reactionary, but, but the reality is what's, what are we gonna see now? So office building, residential building, what do they do now? They check your temperature when you come in. I mean, it's such a, it, 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 again, it's not that there's that much more that you could do, but, but there's always this kind of something happened. We're very reactionary, but there's not enough thought. And, and I really appreciate what, what both gentlemen were saying about the preventive medicine. It's interesting because you can see some of the comments and the questions that people have in the crowd. And a lady by the name of Karen was asking who actually takes the cost of making healthcare preventative. Now, I don't know. That's a very, I, I'm just curious about that. Uh, um, if, if anybody can answer I'll, that. I'll, give you, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll definitely give you the answer to that. Not, I, nothing about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a spectator I mean, here. I mean, there's a major focus on uh, Medicare Advantage uh, plans to develop supplemental facility, uh, activities, which they're paying for, which are to try to prevent uh, readmission rates. I'd say that it's more readmission than, than before the fact, because they don't have enough in the case. Oops, we lost the chat. No, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. 
Oh, we lost. Let we really did lose a clip. Um, yeah. See, um, let me. I, that doesn't happen say. when you're in person. That, <laughs> yes, that's true. true. I agree uh, with you, know, you very much. In person is my favorite. So, my, so my then, only then thing you, to, you can do relationships on Zoom. I think you need to. I think you need to actually have the in person too. You'll need both. But you know, uh, to give credit, we all all of us couldn't be on the same meeting. You know, between India and 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 you it's know, amazing. four yeah. continents here. Yeah, or three. Yeah. So. When we shift from curative to preventive, one thing we need to realize, 70% of our healthcare expenses happen in the last three years of our life. When we know that we are sick, when we know that most probably, you know, our, our um, life is not going to be prolonged too much and we are going to die, right? If we shift that focus, a part of that money and, and shift it to preventive, our overall cost will come down, insurance costs will come down, and we are going to live healthy longer. I think that's the shift and the economics, I think, will work if, if we do it all together. And if you do it early on rather than late, if you do it too late, then it's, you know, it's not going to work. Chris, isn't that a chicken and egg story? Like who starts, right? Yes, it, 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 you're right. If it happens, if, if you can flip the switch and it all works, of course it's great. But, but who goes first? Who goes and lays out the billions of dollars that is needed you know, in every country to go to go do preventive preventive medicine for to get to get an ROI, you know, over a ten year period. I mean, but but uh, Michael, uh, uh, that transition will happen because the venture community is starting to invest in healthcare in a big way. Uh, you know, uh, technology is advancing. You know, look at messenger RNA technology, which allows us to address even. Now, in the future, cancer or tuberculosis or malaria and things like that. Uh, wearable devices are going to allow us to monitor on a continuous basis and give us uh, early warning. So the venture community is investing now heavily into um, healthcare and, uh, and coming up with technologies that allows us to look at preventive care. Yeah, I think the business community and leadership can play a key role in terms of uh, the question that Michael asked, because if you have uh, organizations deciding to bring that as part of uh, their own uh, beneficial structure for their employees and create that value at, uh, in terms of preventive uh, health care value for their staff along the line with the curative being a value that you gave, that might not be normal. Everybody's careful about cost and all of that. But ultimately, your healthier... Uh, I got that. My, my, power, my, my, my my greater value. Yeah. Can you hear me or am I talking to no, myself? No, we hear you fine. We hear you fine. Uh, oh, okay. So it's it, those are part of the disruptive nature. We're going to have to make unusual decisions and uh, be the ones to run first on some of these things for organizations that uh, we lead or that will run in order to start the change, change that is necessary. You know, one of the things I think when you're right, 100% is that we know that private sector, more so today than ever before, CEOs in particular need to lead. We might get, we will, civil society needs that partnership and government needs that leadership. And, and I think, you know, whether it's globally or whether it's regionally, and or locally. And I think, you know, when the private sector comes up and says, you know, we're going to do this, we have the ingenuity, the idea, we have the, we'll take the risk, then public sector supports. And you saw that with the vaccine, clearly. Uh, and you're seeing that over and over again with technology, what you were saying, Chris, with venture. Um, and obviously, what you're saying with ingenuity, creativity, Michael, as well. And, and we're all rooting for, uh, we're all rooting for Alan Patrickoff that we're going to be able to come up with some great things. Uh, for the Alan, 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 can I, Alan got shut up. I was going to mention one other thing we were talking about telemedicine and remote. One of the latest developments is that uh, this concept of hospitals at home. The hospitals uh, can't handle what they're flowing. So what they're doing is developing new technologies to, in effect, uh, create a the same benefits you would get by going to the emergency room to get them in your house so you don't have to make the visit. So, I mean, there are all kinds of new technologies that are developing that not just to help the, the ageless population, but to help everybody. Telemedicine is a major impact. No, that's, that's, I mean, again, technology bringing us closer together, in person bringing us closer together. I think the one thing that 
uh, the theme of this conversation is that we need leadership from the private sector in partnership with, with public and civil society sectors. Yeah. And we need the ingenuity and creativity from capital investment if we want to close the gaps and, and, and create more opportunity. Uh, and we need technology to be that investment. And then, and then when you think about coming together uh, and collaborating and creating cooperative environments, we're asking ourselves if we're going to get out of our pajamas, if the way Michael described it, and we're going to go to the office, uh, we want to make sure that it's in an environment that actually is conducive for that kind of community feeling and, and collaborative feeling that we all seek as well. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, though. We're going to have to figure out how to manage this, this, this uncertainties of health, uh, and we're certainly going to have to manage the uncertainties of, uh, of uh, hybrid technology versus being in person. But I feel closer to each one of you by being on this uh, for